It is a conflict with heavy ethnic undertones and since it started on the 15th of December, it has left nearly 200,000 displaced and at least 1,000 dead. The violence started after President Salva Kiir accused his sacked Vice President Riek Meshar of attempting a coup, an allegation that he denies. On Tech 5 tonight, the Ambassador of South Sudan to Uganda, Samuel Luate, takes your questions. Join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, SMS. Our hashtag is hash NTV Tech 5. You can also get us on our Facebook page on NTV Uganda fan page. Our SMS number is 8778. Remember to begin with Tech 5 or send us an email on tech5 at ntvuganda.co.ug. Ms. Oleti, thank you so much for joining us on NTV tonight. Yeah, thank you for having me tonight. Well, let's get right into the questions. I have Darius Nkwasiba who says, do you think Uganda's intervention in South Sudan affairs will help to solve something? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I, what people have been saying of Uganda being in South Sudan, actually. But we must understand that Uganda has been in South Sudan for a period of a long time. We have an agreement between Uganda uh, South Sudan and DRC uh, to flush out the rebels of the law resistance army. So Uganda has been there for a long time in South Sudan. It is not now that Uganda now has gone to South Sudan. But it has been there for the purpose of this cooperation together in order to get the military uh, of law resistance out of that country. Its presence and, uh, regarding this particular situation, um, this particular conflict, Will it help anything? I think that's what uh, Gwasibu is saying. Well, definitely, definitely. This is, uh, you know, we, we do not want it to see a situation of Rwanda again in South Sudan. There are those who are saying that the intervention of Uganda in South Sudan is completely nonsense there. It is not nonsense. Because if we are to see what is happening in South Sudan now completely, it may lead us to that situation that is happening in Rwanda. And therefore, it is the responsibility of the international community, the IGAT, as a whole including Uganda, if that necessity be there. All right. Um, we have Del Emmanuel Okumo who says, what are the fundamental problems affecting peaceful negotiations and balance of power among the SPLA? Well, the fundamental negotiations that uh, we have now, uh, definitely following this coup d'etat that has just happened in South Sudan. Attempted or? It is, it is an attempted coup d'etat okay. that has actually failed. And that it resulted completely into this uh, scenario of that has deteriorated now into a trouble a kind of a fight. Uh, some people have studied to be a trouble, a trouble fight, but it is not a trouble type fight actually. It is a political fight. And we, so we say that if it is a political fight, then it must be brought to the table to be negotiated by the politicians. And it should not degenerate to become an ethnic cleansing kind of a situation. So this is what we are saying. And therefore, the balancing of power, if it is to be there, it has to be on the table, but not in the military scenario. That is exactly what we are saying as a government. Well, in relation to that, uh, someone makes a comment, Emmanuel Batengaya, who says, why do people refer to it as an ethnic conflict? Are they fought before the creation of South Sudan? It is a power struggle with their allies on oil and gas. No. The situation is not that way, actually. If you see uh, this attempted coup d'etat, it is not the first coup d'etat that has happened in South Sudan. We had a coup d'etat that was mounted by the same vice president, 1991, that he was attempted to overthrow Dr. John Grant yes. during the liberation struggle. And this individual killed a lot of people. He used this white army, he came to town of Bor and killed, massacred the people of uh, Bor, the Dinga community in Bor. He brought in Nuerus, who are good people, to this conflict. And so this is a power struggle that actually uh, Riyadh Bashar would want it now to carry it up again. If you see that this is not the first time, as I mentioned earlier on, Riyadh Bashar committed that crime in 1991, in which he killed almost over 2,000 people in war. He defected, he went to Khartoum government, joined Khartoum regime, came back to South Sudan with the Khartoum forces and massacred more people at the same time. We brought him back to the country. And we've seen a repeat. Forest. And now it is a repeat again of this coup d'etat. We are saying, if you want power, you must go to the people because the power is with the people. The power is not with the army and the power is not with anybody. The power rests with the people and that's where you get power directly. Oh, my next 
for all the damages and the lives lost in this conflict does the government have a hand in this or is it, is it the rebels alone definitely this is the responsibility of dr riyak mashar president salbakir have not initiated any killing or any atrocities in the country it was an issue that emanated from the political divisions and it is him that actually uh, ran out of the country and agitated this coup d'etat himself. And I said, as a result, he has now decided killing our people and has killed several people of South Sudan there. So it is the responsibility of Riyak Mashar himself and not the president of South Sudan, General Salva Kir Mayardi. Uh, we have Hassan Esiat who thinks a little different. He says, uh, was the president properly advised on the way he sacked his vice and shuffling the cabinet at the same time, don't you think this could be the cause of all the chaos? Well, you understand that the government of South Sudan, just like any other president in the world, has got that responsibility. That jurisdiction is lies with the president of the republic. The sacking of the vice president and the cabinet, it was not the prerogative of the president for a say, but the people of South Sudan, these people have been there in the government since 2005. They have never delivered to the people of South Sudan at all. Mm. They have not delivered that. And therefore, as the president has put there and put them there to provide these services to the people, and they fail, the pressure of the people of South Sudan is saying, no, we, we cannot carry on with this because they're not delivering this thing. So the sacking of the cabinet uh, affairs ministers was purely because of their failures to produce services to the people. The sacking of Dr. Riyad Mashar from his position, therefore, it emanated from his uh, arrogancy of not respecting the president at all, of uh, declaring himself to become the president of the Republic of South Sudan, not waiting for the convention to nominate who will be the standing buyer of the SPLM political party. And therefore, if you are serving with your president office, and at the same time you declare yourself to become a president, while you are a sitting vice president, that is completely against the constitution of the Republic of South Sudan, just like any other constitution. To become a leader, to become a bearer in the political party, it is the people that will give it to you during a convention. And these are the reasons that actually led to the vice president to be sacked from the office. All right. Well, we have Daniel Chintu who is asking where is Riek Mashar now as we speak? Well, uh, we are not aware of him, of his whereabout. Uh, the other day he said he was in the bush. That is in a place where he did not even have a light there. And there is no provisions that uh, uh, he can see the world. But all of a sudden, the BBC satellite saw him sitting somewhere dressing in a suit. I don't know where he is, whether he is in a country, whether he is uh, somewhere else, I don't know. But, uh, of course, he should be uh, somewhere he knows it better. We don't know it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, most of the other questions are basically asking what Ugandan forces are doing on um, South Sudan soil in regard to this conflict, but you answered that at the beginning of this, uh, this session, so I, I won't take But I can still give you some more here. Yes. You know, Ugandans have gone to South Sudan just like other countries that have gone to South Sudan. We have the, we have the United States that has come to South Sudan to rescue their people. We have Kenyans that has come to South Sudan to rescue their people. We have Ugandans that has come to South Sudan to rescue their people. We have the British that has come to South Sudan to rescue their people. And therefore, the presence of Ugandans there. There are other people who say Ugandans has gone militarily, you know, to, to attack these rebels. That is not true. That is false. Ugandans are there at this particular moment to make sure that the citizens of Ugandans are properly evacuated. Just like what the Americans have done in that country. Once they are moving from their embassy to the airport, Definitely the forces that belong to that country that were sent there to rescue their people will be on the guard to make sure that these individuals are protected from where they are from up to the airport. And therefore in that process you will see that there will be military activities to say that nobody shoots at them. So Ugandans are there in South Sudan at this particular moment to make sure that Ugandans are protected to be evacuated just like the other countries have done that. But there are these uh, allegations the that... The uh, in the minds of most people is that they are actually there to join the South Sudan troops to fight the rebels. But let me tell you this. If we are to call Ugandans to come into South Sudan, what is the fear here? There's no fear from the government of South Sudan. The government of South Sudan is a legitimate sovereign state. 
that if it deems necessary that it is threatened, the peace of that country and tranquility is threatened, it has, that, it has that prerogative to invite any other nation to come for its own rescue. But at the moment, we are not uh, inviting Uganda to come to South Sudan and fall because we have that military might that we have in South Sudan at this moment. What is taking things longer now in, 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 in war is because Riyad Mashar is using children of 12 years, 13 years, 14 years, and 15 years. These are children that are innocent. These are cattle keepers. These are people that uh, does not even have any military background, you know, to fight a mighty army of South Sudan. And so the problem was that we had been telling the international community, we are saying, please tell Riyak Mashar and those who will listen to tell these children to go back to where they are brought from. Because if anything happens, tomorrow we will be blamed of killing our own children. And that's why we do not want it really to go forcefully, you know, to these kids. Because we actually allow them to bore. We allow them to enter war because when you saw kids are coming in, they were allowed to enter war because nobody wanted to fight them in that case. So Riyad Mashar must be told. Those that have the influence over Riyad Mashar, the international community should understand this position that Riyad Mashar cannot be allowed to massacre the people of South Sudan for his power greed. He wanted the power, he wanted leadership. Salva Kiir was elected by the people of the Republic of South Sudan in 2010. And therefore, if he wanted to take over from Salva Kiir Mayar did, Riyad Mashar need to take his case to the people. It is the people who will determine who will be in that, in that, uh, in that position. Well, th thank you. Know. Thank you so much, yeah, Ambassador Luate, for joining us. Taking these questions from the public, thank you very, very much. I hope. Thank you.